It is such an honor to be here with you today. I'd like to start by sharing a picture with you. It's the picture of an 18-month-old. See, we can take a look at an 18-month-old in this country and predict with alarming accuracy what his place is going to be in the universe. Not based on his early capabilities, not based on his passions and his interests, but based solely on his parents' level of education and his zip code. What does that tell our children about their ability to find their place in the universe? You may have read a New York Times article late last year chronicling the college journeys of three best friends from Texas, Angelica, Bianca, and Melissa. Although they are not related, one counselor referred to them as triplets because they were so close, bound by similar life experiences and circumstances. All three grew up in a low-income community in Galveston, Texas. All three attended the same low-performing, high-poverty high school, where only a third of their classmates graduate on time. And all three are the first in their families to go to college. They were so excited as they embarked on their journey in the fall of 2008. Melissa, one of the triplets, had this to say about their college journeys. We were so thrilled. It felt as if we were taking flight from one life to the next. While the article followed them, and four years later, neither of the triplets has a college degree. Melissa is the only one who is still enrolled in college. She is a fifth-year senior at Texas State, crippled by debt as a result of a failed relationship. She almost dropped out because it was so psychologically disarming. Bianca turned down an opportunity to transfer to a four-year school because she wanted to be close to family and friends and a boy. And today, she's working two jobs one at a bar and one at a spa. And Angelica, who had shown so much promise as she headed off to Emory, had to drop out. She fell through so many tracks and cracks at Emory, based largely because she was unable to navigate a complex financial aid system that had the daughter of a single mom who earns $35,000 a year borrow $40,000 to be able to finance her first year of college. What do we tell Angelica, Bianca, and Melissa about their ability to find their place in the universe? Their story resonated so much with me because their story is my story. I was born in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, and my parents left me at the age of three months old in the care of my beloved grandmother, who you see here on the right, Mommy Claire. And Mommy Claire explained to me that their absence was an opportunity to ensure my success. Success, Mommy Claire explained, meant that I had to do well in school because I had to honor this amazing sacrifice that my parents had made for me. This theme continued to govern my academic experiences when I was eventually reunited with them in inner city Boston. But at that point, honoring their sacrifice meant that I had to go to college. Since neither of my parents had been to college, it was this abstract thing that we talked about. We didn't really know what it took to get there or how I was gonna get there, how I was gonna pay for it, but we knew that I had to go. Luckily, I had a very crafty mom who got her information by eavesdropping on other people's conversations. <laughs> and she started listening to people who had gone to college and who were sending their kids off to college. My mom worked as a phlebotomist in a hospital in Dorchester, Massachusetts. 
And one day she came running home all excited because she had overheard a conversation that a bunch of doctors were having about sending their kids to college. And she said to me, you have to go to this thing called an Ivy League. <laughs> and you have to go to this place called Dartmouth. And that was how the dream of a specific institution was born. <laughs> Through an overheard conversation in the emergency room of a hospital. So then I started dreaming about going to Dartmouth. I still remember the thrill and the excitement we all felt when those college acceptance letters started coming in. And when the one from Dartmouth came, my mom finally realized that it was pronounced Dartmouth and not Dartmouth. <laughs> we treated the moment almost as if we had won the lottery. And we assumed that the most difficult part of the journey was behind us. Boy, were we wrong. I remember the day that we all traveled to Hanover, New Hampshire from Boston. And we traveled in a caravan, 10 cars deep. So that caravan included my mom, my dad, my younger sister, my younger cousins, my aunts, my uncles, my grandmother, my friends. <laughs> Everybody who had been part of this journey because they all wanted to see it through because we thought the end really sort of happened when they dropped me off on that campus. So Hanover certainly didn't know what hit it when we showed up. <laughs> Neither did my roommate, as like 20 people were trying to navigate this little small room that we were going to share. But again, as my caravan left, we assumed that the most difficult part of the journey was behind me. I completely bombed my freshman year at Dartmouth. I bombed academically, I bombed socially, I bombed emotionally, I bombed financially. And I quickly discovered that getting that college acceptance letter and getting in was only the first step. Luckily, I was able to turn things around. I regained my footing through sheer grit and determination and a wonderful peer network. I was able to graduate from Dartmouth and I later went on to Stanford to earn my master's. While my story has a happy ending, each year hundreds and thousands of low-income students armed with their college acceptance letters embark on their college journeys believing like I did, like Angelica did, like Bianca did, like Melissa did, that they are prepared for the road ahead. But the statistics tell us otherwise. Only 8% of students in the US from the lowest income quartile can expect to earn a bachelor's degree by their mid-20s. This is versus 82% of their peers from the highest income quartile. What does that mean to students when they understand these statistics? And what does that mean in terms of their trying to find their place in the universe? Now, what's at the root of this statistic? Quite simply, a broken educational system. There is a significant disconnect between our lower education system, our K-12 schools, and our higher education system, our colleges and universities. Right now, both systems are operating without a direct link. The curricular standards required to graduate from high school and those expected of students upon college entry are significantly different. There are disconnects all over the system. Our kindergartens aren't preparing our students for success in elementary, elementary not preparing our students for success in middle, middle not for success in high school, high school not for success in college, and college not for success in the workforce. The impact of that disconnect is that we are losing critical talent, hundreds of thousands of students along these artificial barriers that we've created along this educational system. When you think about the high school to college transition, the impact of that disconnect is that we are creating lots of students who are college eligible, but not college ready. So I found my place in the universe in 2009 
by creating an organization called Beyond 12. We are a national nonprofit organization, and our mission is to increase the number of low-income students like Angelica, like Bianca, like Melissa, like me, who graduate from our nation's colleges and universities. We are a technology-enabled service organization, and we do three things. We track, we connect, and we coach. The first way that we advance our mission is through a technology platform that allows us to collect data about how kids are doing in college and eventually how kids are doing when they enter the workforce. And the goal is to synthesize this data and to bring it back to our educational institutions so that they can make decisions about how to better prepare and support future generations of college students. The second way that we advance our mission is by connecting students through social utility tools like Facebook. We've built a Facebook app that allows us to connect students to each other to build their collegiate networks, to connect them to valuable resources on their campuses, and to communicate data about how they're doing to their various support networks. The last piece of the work that we do is using the data. We identify students who are in most need of help, and we pair them with a college coach. Ours is a near-peer model, so our coaches are recent college graduates, the majority of whom were the first in their families to attend college. So they understand firsthand the challenges that our students are facing on their road to earning a college degree. And it is this combination of a technology and a service that allows us to impact not just the 20,000 plus students in our system, but their institutions, their high schools and their colleges. While our mission is about ensuring that low-income kids get into college and graduate from college, most importantly, our vision is so much more broad. I envision a day where every single student will have the opportunity to earn a college degree and a credential that allows them to contribute to society, change outcomes for their families, and break the cycle of poverty for the next generation. But we can't do that with our current educational system. I'd like you to indulge me in a game of what if. What if, instead of the disjointed educational system we currently have, we have one educational system that is aligned, we can call it P16, that extends from preschool through higher education and workforce entry? And what if that one system were based on the simple foundation that success in college, career, and life starts in preschool and before? What if that one system were housed in the same infrastructure? What if that one system were agile and flexible, and we allowed students to move in and out of the system and their place in the system weren't so based on their geography and their neighborhoods, but based on their interests and their needs? And what if instruction in that system were delivered in very innovative ways? Sure, we can continue the face-to-face -face that we know is so important to human development, but what if instruction were delivered online, virtually, through mobile devices, peer-to-peer -peer networks and peer-to-peer -peer learning? self-directed learning? What if we didn't shut off Facebook and Tumblr when our students were walking through those educational doors because we understood the opportunity to use those systems to help engage and to make our teaching and learning process a lot more creative? What if we allowed students to explore internship opportunities while they were still in this system that connected them to their local businesses and that allowed them to try a couple of those different opportunities? And what if we had one longitudinal data system with a unique student identifier that allowed us to trace students' progress, not in a scary big brother way, but in a way that allowed us to truly understand how students were faring along this system? What if we empowered them with this unique identifier and their data and they made decisions about how to use this information? This is the biggest what if. What if this system 
eliminated the need for us to complete this complicated federal financial aid form because this system were free. It was part of pu public education. What if? What if we created a system that really allowed students to find their place in the universe? What would that be like? How would Angelica, Bianca, and Melissa have fared in that system? I'd like to bring you back to where we started. See, Lucas isn't just a random 18-month-old. He's actually my son. And in addition to this being a shameless plug for a new mom to show you her son, I brought him here today because I'd like to ask for your help. Your help in creating a system where we can look at a child like Lucas, an 18-month-old, and not be able to predict where he is going to be or his place in the universe. Where we can say he can be anything that he wants to be, but whatever he decides to be is a result of his intellect, his capabilities, his interest and his passions, not because his mom happens to have a degree from Dartmouth and Stanford, and not because his mom has moved from zip code 02126 to zip code 94611. Thank you so much.